Nine months before Christmas, the angel told her the news. She was probably startled, a little confused. And as Gabriel told her what would happen in her time, Mary listened close, and this is how she replied. I'm a willing, I'm a willing, let what you said be done to me, and I'll love and care and teach and smile, knowing that this is God's only child, I'm just thankful for what I can do to see God make things new. Eternity ago, God saw the world that we would go. He didn't want to leave us in our sin. He knew a perfect one would have to pay to make our sin go away. Then the Son of God said, Good morning. Welcome. What a great morning. There is a sun, right? It did come out the last couple of days, so it's good to see that. Welcome to East Columbus Christian Church. If you're watching online, we welcome you as well. Uh, I just want to read scripture to open us up this morning. This comes from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. That's the God we come to worship this morning. So I'm going to ask you to stand as we get ready to worship and, and join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do come to you right now just excited to be able to give you glory, honor, and praise. Father, we come. Some of us may need to just hear your word this morning. Uh, if we need just to listen, just allow us to be open Open our minds, open our hearts to what you have in store for us. And, and right now, Lord, may these songs that we sing and the things that we say in Ron's message all bring you glory and honor. And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us. We forgive the ones who sin against us. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On that path in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day and daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us. As we forgive the ones who sin against us. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. From the evil one, let your kingdom come. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. Forever and ever, the kingdom is yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. Forever and ever, the kingdom is yours. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On the path in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On the path in heaven, right here in my heart. On the path in heaven, right here in my heart. The promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Sing it out Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fall. In the howling storms of doubt and fear of sin. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. I'm standing, standing, standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. See, 
on the hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me, my Jesus set me free. Look at the wounds they give me life, grace flowing from his side, no greater sacrifice. What he's done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what He's done. Sing for the freedom. As one, even death is dead and done. His life is overcome. Speak, say the name above all names, over every broken place. He is risen from the grave. What he's done, what he's All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what He's done. Amen. You may be seated. In the garden, Adam and Eve had a perfect relationship with God. However, when they disobeyed God's command, sin entered the world, and they were separated from God. Because of their sin, life became a struggle, a struggle for food, a life full of hard work, a nearly hopeless life ending in death. Today, the world still struggles with these same conditions, but now there is hope and is found in Jesus Christ. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he explained that before they were Christians, they faced a serious problem in their lives. Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 2 reads, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Paul didn't try to be politically correct to describe their previous dilemma. He told it as it was. He said, you were dead, not ill or terminal or dying, but dead. They had a serious problem. He also told them that this death problem impacted others. And verse 3 continues, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. All of them were dead. Paul didn't say some of you he didn't say, you Greeks or those Jews. Paul lumped all people together as dead. Their death resulted from sinful desires at work in their bodies. Death was the fruit of their cravings of the flesh. All Ephesians faced the same gigantic problem from which there was no hope. Where is our hope? How often are we overwhelmed by life's circumstances? And how often do we feel we have no hope? What Paul wrote next in verses 4 and 5 transforms everything in the lives of Jesus' disciples. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. 
It is by grace you have been saved. The gospel message can be summed up in six words. God loves. Jesus. Sin separates. Jesus saves. What has he done? God overcame our problem of death, sin, and judgment through Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection. He transformed Christians into people who are truly alive and living in the presence of the Creator. Jesus' body saved us from death. Jesus' blood makes us alive. We can overcome any struggle by building our hope on what God promised through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Only in Christ's sacrifice, body, and blood can we find hope that will endure. A hope that can fill our presence with a purpose and joy that the world cannot steal. A hope that will prepare us for an eternity in God's presence. This morning, as you eat the bread, which is a reminder of Jesus' body, and drink from the cup, which is the picture of his life blood offered up for all of us, Take this time to give thanks to God for the demonstration of his overcoming power. Let's pray. What he's done, what he's done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross to pay our debt so that we may be set free from the bondage of sin. Thank you for the gift of salvation and the promise of eternal life with you. Amen. Keep strumming that song. Um, 
Kids can go ahead and leave for Children's Church. I just want to hear your voices. Sometimes I can't hear your voices because I'm so close to the instruments. But can we just sing that chorus again, what he's done? Just one last time. What he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son, my sins are forgiven, my future is heaven, I praise God for what he's done, my sins are forgiven. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what He's done. Would you just praise God for what He's done? He's done so much. Um, I got to be honest, I missed being here with you last uh, week, as, as Kendall mentioned. Uh, I was away preaching a revival at my brother's church, and I missed my church family. I missed my worship team. I just missed being with you. Uh, I did hear that we did have one young lady that gave her life to Christ and was baptized, and so we praise God for that. Um, Not only do we praise Him for what He's done, but we praise Him for what He's doing, because I see Him doing amazing things, not just in this place, but uh, just to give you a little report on, on my brother's church, a lot of you uh, know the story of what happened, uh, has happened there with, with him and his stroke and different things, and they got a new church building a little while back, and, and uh, he became the preacher there not long after uh, I started here, and the church was just a little old country church running about 25, 30 people on a Sunday morning. The Sunday after Easter, which is a traditionally down day, uh, they had 110 people in their worship service, and to go from 30 to 110, God's not just doing something in this place, He's doing stuff in other places, and I rejoice with what I see other churches doing. I know Patrick, a lot of you have a connection to Patrick Glasser, Mount Auburn Christian Church is, is doing great as well, and, and it's just so exciting to see not only what He's done, but what He is doing. And I think God's going to do something very special through this sermon series that we're talking about uh, starting today uh, that we're calling Weeds in, in the Garden. And it's a sermon series that will discuss some of the different issues uh, with, with mental health, how the Bible looks at those things and how the Bible speaks into some of those things. And so uh, as I was talking with several people uh, this, this week, um, I'm just a little nervous about starting this series for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, I'm, I'm not an authority on speaking into mental health issues. So I had to have a lot of, a lot of help with this from people like Rick Atchley and Craig Groeschel and a guy uh, by the name of Clayton Hansel and, and then some, some professionals outside of the ministry as well. And so uh, I'm a little nervous about it because it's not my area of expertise for sure, and then uh, uh, I'm, I'm also nervous about it just because it, it's, there's so many people that are affected by this, and I just want God's spirit to be in the midst of all of this, and I want people to be able to uh, just rest in comfort, uh, in the comfort of God's word, and so before we dig in, uh, I want to ask you to pray with me, and then uh, we'll get going. Father, I thank you for uh, your word. I thank you for uh, this church. God, I thank you for what you are doing and what you have done. And I just pray that you would continue to use us to build your kingdom. God, that more and more and more people will come to know you and the difference that you make in a person's life when they surrender to you. So we, we just pray that you would have your way through this whole series, God, that um, I would speak truth and that uh, lives could possibly be changed because of it. We ask it all in in Jesus' name. Amen. I heard a story about a visit uh, that a a pastor took to a a mental asylum, and uh, the pastor asked the director of the asylum what the criteria was to define whether or not there was some type of uh, mental uh, situation where the person was needing to be institutionalized. And the doctor said, well, here's what we do. 
When, when a person comes in, we fill up a bathtub, and then we offer them a teaspoon, a teacup, or a bucket, and we ask the patient to empty the bathtub. And the pastor said, okay, I get it. A normal person would use the bucket because it's the largest, right? He said, no, a normal person would unplug it. Where would you like your room? Uh, <laughs> now, if we're honest with ourselves, um, we all struggle with issues in our life. We all struggle with our minds not being at the right place from one time or another. Sometimes it, it's just flat out, uh, you know, a mental health issue. We deal with worry, we deal with anxiety, we deal with depression, anger, so on and so forth. So forth. And that's why Clayton Hensel, when he spoke in, uh, uh, at, at the Spire Conference in Nashville, he spoke this, this series, he called it uh, weeds, weeds in My Garden, Weeds in the Garden, something along those lines. And, and I heard that, I thought, this is something that, that, that we need to dive into. This is something that we need to talk about because I feel like some of the areas in which uh, the church has been silent are the issues that have grown to the point that, that they're kind of out of control and not, um, uh, I guess Christians aren't behaving like Christians should in some areas because the church has not spoken into some of these things. For instance, we've been afraid to speak into money issues at times. And so there are people who have money issues in the church because we haven't spoken into it. There are sexual issues that the church has thought to be taboo. And so we haven't, uh, we haven't gone there because we're afraid of, of what the outcome might be. And now we see all kinds of people dealing with issues because we haven't spoken into it. And so Clayton Hensel, when he spoke on this subject, I knew it was something that we need to deal with because I think there's a lot of people who are struggling with issues that we don't even know they're struggling with. And so over the next six weeks or so, we're going to dive into these things. Now, if you're watching online, I'm so glad that you're, you're with us today. Um, I want you to know that God loves you. I want you to know that this church loves you. And if there's something that we say along the lines here uh, and, and you want to reach out and speak to us about something, we'd love for you to, to do that. Uh, if you're new here today, if this is your first time here, we welcome you uh, today and we pray that you're blessed by what we have to talk about. But it's hard to believe that uh, the pandemic began four years ago, and honestly, I'm sick of hearing about it. Is anybody with me on that? I am just so sick of hearing about it. We referred, I've referred to it in, in sermons before. I know we've referred to it in meditations, and I just wish we could just quit talking about it, right? Uh, but the reality is, even, even before the pandemic started, there were all types of mental health issues out there that... Um, people were struggling with. And then when COVID started, it was almost like pouring gasoline on the fire. And it seems like those mental issues became more and more, um, I guess, intense and more and more widespread. And so reports started surfacing right out of COVID that... Uh, even ministers, across, not that ministers are any more special than anybody else, but ministers were struggling with mental health issues. I even know of some that took their own lives. It was reported that 38% of all ministers during the pandemic contemplating, contemplated leaving the ministry. And so if, if we're struggling with it, and most of us are pretty normal, amen, Most, yeah, I mean, you, man, okay, I could use another vacation maybe, I'm not real sure, uh, but it, seriously, if 38% of ministers were struggling so bad with their mental health that they contemplated leaving the ministry, then it makes me wonder how many people uh, that aren't in ministry are dealing with that as well, right? Uh Ben Kacharis, who was the senior minister at Mountain Christian Church, wrote in the Christian Standard this. He said, we have a problem. Emotional well-being is in serious decline. It's a palpable crisis that was bad before the pandemic. The isolation, social upheaval, polarization, massive changes with work, school, and life have exacerbated the crisis, creating an extended ambiguity and heightened stress that's a perfect cocktail for burnout and emotional struggle. No wonder the World Health Organization's recent scientific report says that the global rise of anxiety and depression has increased 25% since the pandemic in 2020. Recent surveys 
have said that there have been significant downturns in the attitude of people and soaring levels of anxiety and worry in people's lives ever since. Anxiety is now the number one issue for women. It's the number two issue for men behind alcohol and drugs, and probably it's only number two because we men, we're too proud to say we're anxious, right? And so a lot of men choose to mask it behind other things. Some turn to things like alcohol or drugs or even worse. It's been reported that mental disorders are the leading cause of disability worldwide, according to a 2014 article in the International Journal of of Pediatology. Statistics say that mental disorders now affect one in every five adults. That's 20%, and that percentage is not going down, right? Generation Z, does everybody know what the age group is there, Generation Z? It's 1999 to 2015. Those who were born in 1999 to the year 2015 is the most stressed out generation ever, And in recent years, the share of high school students who say they experience persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness rose from 26% to 44%. That's the highest level of sadness ever recorded in human history. Look at that percentage, 44%. That's almost half of our kids are feeling sadness and hopelessness. That's why we got to dive into this stuff. That's why we've got to be talking about this stuff. And 50% of parents of teens report worsened or new mental health problems in their teens ever since the pandemic started. So I want to put the pandemic behind us, and I'm going to try not to refer to it too much, but I think we have to be real and understand that, that there's been a lot of things that have come into our lives that we maybe didn't even expect because it happened. And a lot of people are dealing with things like depression and anxiety that didn't deal with them before. Many children and young adults are fearful, they're sad, they're struggling with life, and because of that, suicide has now risen uh, to a new level as well. Uh, Statistics are now showing that the second leading cause of death for young people between the ages, and this, this is heartbreaking, between the ages of 10... And 24, it's the second leading cause of death, suicide. That's that's tragic. But here's what I hope. I hope that God in his word will speak to us and those of us who are struggling with those types of issues. I pray that the Holy Spirit will, will guide us to some truth and that we can maybe get some relief if we're really severely struggling with some things that we really don't know how to handle. Kendall Inskeep, uh, does anybody remember her? She was a contestant on The Voice a few years ago. She was on uh, Team Gwen Stefani. Does that help any? Okay, anyway, she wrote a song uh, that's called If We're Honest, and here here are the lyrics. It says, I tell you that I'm whole, but uh, but I'm still healing. I tell you that I'm happy, but I'm grieving. Thought I was a fighter, I'm still in the fire. But if I'm being honest, I'm not being honest. Let let that sink in for just a second. If I'm being honest, I'm not being honest. I'll give you roses just hoping you don't see the weeds in my garden. Don't we do that? How you doing today? I'm doing great. (laughs) We give them roses, we don't show them the weeds, right? Right? If I'm being honest, I'm at my darkest. I'm sitting here waiting and praying for someone to show me what love is. And we have the answer. We have have the solution to what real love is and what true love is and what lasting love is. And it's in the person of Jesus Christ. And and, and so we have to put that message out there as, as much as possible to those people who are dealing with hopelessness in their lives and different issues in their lives that maybe they're trying to find other solutions for. Clayton Hensel was wondering if the words of that song were the same words that people were thinking uh, in his church. And so he did a survey in his church, uh, his church, several thousand people in his church, uh, 1,849 people of his members responded, 24% Uh, of the people that responded were male, 76% were female, 
That's not entirely shocking. Uh, men, we just uh, we don't we we don't really want to go here sometimes, do we? Amen. Okay, all right, very good. But don't tap out on this series because here's the deal. Chances are either a woman birthed you or you're married to one, right? Right? And, and so if it's important to them, it ought to be important to you. And the Bible says, men, we are to love uh, our wives just as Christ loved the church. And so if your wife is struggling with something that maybe you don't understand or you don't get and you think, well, it's just, you know, kind of something that, that maybe we can just kind of push to the side and bury and not talk about it, and it'll just kind of go away. If you love her like you're supposed to love her, then you need to go there with her. It also means that your daughter or your granddaughter or your sister may very well be struggling as well. So here are the statistics. I'm going to put these on the screen. This isn't our church, but this is a Christian church in Illinois, so it's probably not too different from us. So they... they they uh, surveyed these people, 24% again were, were male, 76% were female. This is how they responded. 6% responded by saying they, they didn't have any issues. 82% responded by saying they deal with anxiety and worry. 71% said they deal with burnout or stress. 48% deal with depression, 51% deal with self-esteem issues, and a lot of these overlap, and some of them cause the other ones, I understand. Uh, 9% of his, 9% of his church, think about this, we're dealing with thoughts of suicide and self-harm, and then 19% we're dealing with trauma issues, and so if our church were being honest, now we didn't do this survey, maybe I should have. If we were being honest, we're probably hiding some stuff from people. Some of us are probably going through some things that, that, um, that we don't know you're going through because you don't want us to see the wheat. You're just, you're just giving us giving us the roses. So here, here's what I want to do. Uh, we're we're going to dive into the weeds, and uh, here's a couple of principles to guide us. The first one is this. Don't be quick to judge a problem without considering perspective. Here's, here's what happens. We have this tendency to be narrow-minded when it comes to mental health issues. Uh, mental health issues are composed from what I understand. Again, I had to have the professionals help with this, and uh, it's composed of four main categories. They're either situational clinical, medical, or spiritual. Some of you are experiencing issues right now because of the situation that you are in. Others are dealing with issues because of the way that you were put together in a fallen world. In other words, you're just wired that way, and, you're, and, and now you have to live in a world that is, is kind of messed up. Not kind of messed up, is messed up. And there are some of you that probably need medical attention and you need uh, doctor's uh, prescriptions, you need some, some professional counselors to get you the proper help and treatment that you need. And then there are some of you, I'll just be honest, since we're going to be honest, right? Some of you have spiritual issues that's related to your sin and the way that you're living your life, and, you, and you, need to, you need to let those things go. And so when you are narrow in your, your thinking and you're narrow in your approach, it can negatively affect your perspective. And so what you'll have a tendency to do is you'll have an issue in your life that you'll make it maybe a spiritual issue when it's actually a medical issue. Or you think it's a medical issue, but it's actually a spiritual issue. And, and it may be a situation where you don't have a lack of faith, but it's just the way that you're you're hardwired. God just made you that way. Here's the deal. This is what, this doesn't make any sense to me. When we see a person who has been diagnosed with cancer, we don't address their sin issues, do we? We say, you need to get to a doctor. You need to get some treatment, right? And so we need to make sure that we adequately diagnose what the problem is. It's one of those four things. Someone put it this way. This is what Clayton Hensel said. He said, think of mental issues as waves at the lake. Some of the waves might be from a jet ski. In other words, someone has caused trauma in your life. 
Other waves could be because it's windy out, or that is just life, okay? Other waves could be from the rocks that maybe you're picking up and you're throwing into the lake yourself, and it's causing those waves. And then also, it can also change when you think about where on the lake you are. If you're at a point on the lake where uh, nobody hardly ever goes, maybe it's the waves from the wind and the boat are the only things that you, you see because you don't ever see any other people. But for some of you, because of where you're at, you've created this resilience while others have never really experienced calm waters of peace. This is what Clayton Hensel is saying. In other words... We don't really know how to react to a situation because we've never had to deal with it before. And then all of a sudden, we're suddenly thrust into this situation. We're like, what do we do? I know sometimes, uh, and, and some of you can probably relate to this, I've said it myself, okay? I've said it myself. We talk about how these issues didn't exist in my generation. Has anybody, have, have you ever said that? When you look around at the kids, today, well, we never did that, you know? And, we don't see this, this uh, situation going on here, but is that tr actually true? Think back for just a second. Was your dad distant, maybe? Did he lack emotion? Was he maybe a heavy consumer of alcohol? Maybe he did struggle, but you didn't know it because he was masking it with something else. That's how he coped. And the other thing is that for many of us, a core value, and we do this, how many of you have ever said this, I just want to give my kids a better life than what I had, right? And so then, because you're trying to keep them from certain things in their lives, and you're protecting them, and you're hovering over them, and you're just providing everything for them, they're not able to stand on their own. And so when the waves come, they're not able to stand because we've just been there keeping them from, from these things. These things, okay? So keep that, keep that in mind. Second principle is this. Don't underestimate the power of your community. We have become so busy that we don't have time for the things that could become a massive benefit for our mental health. Studies show that people who attend church regularly have a decrease in mental health concerns. Let me repeat that. Studies show that people who attend church regularly have a decrease in mental health concerns. We as a staff, along with the elders of this church, we want good things for you. We don't want anything from you. We exist to serve God and to serve others. And so when I stand up here, or anybody else stands up here and says, it's good for you to come to church. We want you to come to church. We want you to be around other people. We want you to worship God. Here's the reason. It's going to help you. It's going to have a positive chemical effect on you, and it's going to have a positive psychological effect on you. And I'll go a step further and say this, and again, not knocking those who just you know stay home and watch online because, because some just can't help it, but some have just decided to do that, and that's okay. I'm glad you're doing that, but here's the deal. You're not going to experience the same benefits staying at home and watching online as coming in and being around other people because God created us for community. He created us to lean on one another. Here's another thing that we do, <laughs> and I've been guilty of this. We get so busy sometimes that we don't take the time for deep, meaningful relationships. What we do is we have a lot of surface relationships with a lot of different people. And the Bible teaches us that we were made for community. We were made for people to come alongside of us. We were made for people to journey with us through these challenging times. We were made to have different people in our lives give us different perspectives and provide us with care. The problem is oftentimes we end up in shallow, more like online relationships. So when we fall, there's no one there to pick us up. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 says, Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. I don't want you to be in trouble. I want you to build meaningful relationships with people who have the same core values as you do, who have the same um, spiritual um, ideology as, as, as you do, and so that you can come alongside one another and hold one another up. I would also encourage you to, uh, to watch your intake. Fill your hearts and fill your minds with praiseworthy and excellent things. That's what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 8, right? Whatever is true and noble and honest and just and excellent and praiseworthy. Think about these things. Don't think about the junk that the world is throwing at us. Make sure you're spending time in the Word and be careful about your social media intake. If you're going to be online, if you're going to spend any time online, make sure you're careful about who you follow online and how long you participate on it. Caleb and I were just talking about this this morning, about how he's deleted different things on his phone, different apps on his phone, so that he's not burning too much time on social media. Studies are in. social me- This might be a shock to you, but social media, this is a study, social media does not improve mental health. <gasps> Shocking, isn't it? I personally believe that social media has done more to mess with people's minds than any other single thing. And so we got to be careful. We have to be very careful. What we're, I'm not saying it's all bad, but we have to limit it and we have to be careful who we're, who we're following. And when, when you see, when you're scrolling through and you see somebody on Facebook that's got something you don't have, don't let it eat at you. Just like, man, seriously, you know, just kind of put it away for a little while because I know we've all been guilty of that sort of thing, okay? So that's the second principle. Third is this, and, and it, it, I did not put this in your outline. I don't know. I guess it's not a good idea to try to write a sermon when you're on vacation and doing a revival uh, because I forgot to send point number three to our, uh, to our AV people. So uh, here's point number three. It's not in your outline. Write it down. It's okay to not be okay. Because here's the reality of it. None of us are okay by ourselves. It's okay not to be okay. We have this idea that we have to, again, we have to show roses, right? We can't show weeds. We have to be okay all the time. And if somebody's in a little bit of a sour mood, well, what's wrong with that person? I can't believe they're acting that way, right? It's okay to not be okay. The thrust of the gospel is this. Jesus came into a broken, fallen world world and he came to heal and he came to save that means that this world in which we live is broken this world is in peril in fact it's our honesty i think that creates a safe place for others around us to be honest how many of you have ever been in the situation where you've said man i just wish that person was honest with me have you ever been there where you said why weren't they just honest with me The crazy thing is this, how many of you were honest with them when they weren't honest with you? Here's the deal, our our world is hemorrhaging from a lack of hope. Dave was talking about that in his meditation, about our hope and where it comes from. We have a God-given mission to bring hope to the darkest of places, to the darkest of situations, the darkest of times and sometimes the best way to give hope to people is just be honest with them and say listen me too I struggle with that as well that's something I go through as well somebody asked Jesus one time what the greatest commandment was this is what he said in Mark 12 verses 30 and 31 love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul all your mind all your strength The second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. So if we love our neighbor like Jesus has taught us to, and we're trying to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we're doing that, and and we are to love our neighbor, then we need to love them enough to be honest with them and say, listen, you're not alone in this. It's something that I've struggled with as well. Or find something that you can 
you, you can connect with them on. You know, that you might not be struggling with the same thing, but share what your struggle is, maybe, to help them. You guys probably saw the controversial Super Bowl commercial. It's continued to run on He Gets Us. Remember that, that where, where the, man, I, I, didn't, I didn't dream that commercial would cause such backlash. But it shows uh, different people serving different people who are caught up in different sins by washing their feet. And I don't know where you stand on that, but that's not the point of me bringing this up, right? And then at the end of that, he says, He Gets Us. I saw a preacher who was doing a series called He Gets Us, but do we get Him? Hebrews 4.15 says, This high priest of ours, talking about Jesus, this high priest of ours, He understands our weaknesses, for He faced all the same testings we do, yet He did not sin. Yeah, He gets us. But do we understand what He went through for us, Jesus is able to sympathize with it at whatever it is that you're going through. Eric Raymond says it this way. He was homeless in Matthew 8.20. His family thought he was crazy. His best friends turned their back on him. His closest friends sold him to be killed for money. He stood face to face with the devil and endured all his demonic tricks. He dealt with death. He endured gossip and slandered. He endured suffering for righteousness sake. He was shamed publicly. He endured periods of hunger. He received criticism for his ministry. His theology was mocked. His message was rejected. His preaching was critiqued. And his disciples didn't get it. And why did he do this? Why did he go through all of this? Why didn't he just go to the cross? Why didn't God just plop him down there right before it was time to go to the cross and then just let him die for our sins? This is what Hebrews 2 says, verses 17 and 18. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Yeah, he gets us. But we need to understand who our Savior is and what he has done and what he has gone through. And that leads me to a couple of things I want to share with you that are myths about mental health that I think we need to blow out of the water during this series. You need to, you need to plant these in your mind and, and don't forget them. You know, take, your, take your notes home with you, put them on the fridge or on your desk or somewhere where you can see these and understand that these are lies from Satan. The one, first one is this, Christians shouldn't struggle with mental health. There, there's a Greek word that I'd like to use to dispel the myth that Christians shouldn't struggle with with mental health, all right? You might want to write this down in your notes as well. It's a Greek word. I know I'd, I'm not a Greek scholar, uh, but, but I think it dispels this myth. Baloney. Okay? Whoever said Christians shouldn't struggle with mental health, they've not read their Bibles. They've not been around people who are very solid believers who are struggling with different issues. There was a guy in the Old Testament by the name of Heman, not He-Man. It's spelled like He-Man, right? Uh, and not, not the Masters of the Universe guy or the uh, uh, Our Gang Little Rascals, right? The He-Man Woman Haters Club. That's not what we're talking about. It's Heman, H-E-M-A-N. And Heman, he was known for his great wisdom. He was known for his musical ability. He was known for parenting. He was known for his service to the king. I mean, this guy had everything going for him, yet we know that he was the author of Psalm 88. And this is what he wrote in verses 3 through 5. Again, this guy is this guy's really smart. He's talented. He's a great dad. He's in good with the king. He's got everything going for him. This is what he writes. For my life is full of troubles. And death draws near. I am as good as dead, like a strong man with no strength left. They have left me among the dead, and I, like a corpse in a grave, I am forgotten, cut off from your care. Does this sound like a guy that's got everything going for him? 
Then in verses 13 and 14, he says this, O Lord, I cry out to you. I will keep on pleading day by day. O Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you turn your face from me? And then in verse 18, you have taken away my companions and loved ones. Darkness is my closest friend. When I read that, it made me think if this is where Paul Simon got the the opening line from the song uh, Sound of Silence. You know what I'm talking about? Hello, darkness, my old friend. You know, anybody... Okay, all right, so those of you who are 50 or older, you're nodding your heads. Those of you, other kids, who's Simon, Paul Simon? Anyway, I don't know, but Hammond wrote this song long before Paul Simon did, because this is, this is a song. Psalms were songs of praise to God, and he's writing this song, and, and it's such a, man, this song is so sad. You know, uh, darkness is my closest friend, so, so sad. I bet when he sang it, it had a steel guitar Right? And a country beat and a fiddle, you know, all that kind of, because it's such a sad, sad song. But in all seriousness, here's a guy who believed in God, who according to everybody around him, had his act together and everything was going great. And this guy wrote part of scripture. Now think about that. This guy authored part of the Bible. And he was going through it. So don't believe that lie that Christians shouldn't have these kinds of issues. And then finally, we need to bust the myth that says God doesn't care about your mental health. I couldn't be farther from the truth. God does care about every single aspect of your life, even the weeds in your garden. And he wants to help you get rid of those weeds, and we'll deal with that in the following weeks. But here's something you need to understand. Getting help is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of wisdom. Right? It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of wisdom. I just, when I said that, I looked out at Dan there and it made me think about if I didn't ever come to you with my back problems, what kind of shape would I be in? I'd be a mess. Every time I've got back issues, like, Dan, you got any time for me today? And he'll get me in and he'll see me and he'll straighten me out and get me back up to 5'11, right? And so, um, If we didn't do anything, if I didn't do anything about that weakness that I have, I'd be a mess. If you don't do anything about the, the, the mental weakness that you might be dealing with, you're going to find yourself in a situation that uh, it's, it's going to be a mess. Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And in Isaiah 26, 3, it says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. You will keep in perfect peace. There's a Hebrew word there, and this is legit, uh, salmok, okay? The word behind this in the English means to prop or to rest full weight on an object. In other words, what this passage of Scripture is saying is that if your thoughts are fixed on Him, and, and again, I, we, can't, we can't help some of the stinking thinking that pops into our minds unexpectedly. But I think we can choose what we dwell on. And, and so I think the author is saying here that when your thoughts are fixed on Him, He's going to carry you. When you trust in Him, even if the rug of life is pulled out from under you, He's got you. Even when you don't see an answer for your problem, or you don't see a solution to the situation that you're going to love, whenever you can't fathom that happening, understand that God's got you. He'll hold you up. He will sustain you, as some passages of Scripture say. And maybe you're here this morning, and you're already, you're already a Christian, but your thoughts haven't been fixed on Him. They've been on other things like your problems, what other people are thinking about you, what you think you need to do about the situation instead of letting God do His thing. And so maybe that's where some of you are this morning. Maybe there are some of you here this morning who've never given your life to Christ at all, and you're looking for that 
that peace. You're looking for that solution to, to having a, a transformed mind to where maybe you're not thinking some of the thoughts you're thinking. The Bible says that's how uh, you're transformed is, is by the renewing of your mind. And that transformation is going to take place whenever you surrender your life to Jesus. You confess him as the Christ. You repent of your sins. You're baptized into him for the washing away of your sins. And the Bible says you're a new person. And you start filling your heart and your mind with his word. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you understand you were made for community and you don't belong to the community uh, officially and you'd like to do that. You'd like to officially come to the front this morning and say, as a baptized believer already, I want to become a part of the community of East Columbus Christian Church. We invite you to come if that's you this morning. I want to close with a passage of Scripture. It's from Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. I'll just pause there for a second and ask you to ask yourself and be honest with yourself. What is it that's weighing you down? What is it that's slowing you down that you need to strip off so that you can follow Jesus the way that you need to follow Jesus? Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now... He's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Let's stand together and let's pray. Father, um, we're going to sing a song here, Lord, that says that you're our firm foundation, and that is true. Anything else that we try to build our lives on is just going to crumble. Satan's going to come in and He's going to try to steal our joy. He's going to try to rob us of your blessings. He's just going to try to out and out kill us. And Lord, it's my prayer that everybody in this room makes you his or her foundation for every aspect of our lives. Lord, if there's anyone here today that needs to make a decision to follow you, I pray that they'd do that. Lord, if there's anyone here today that's been struggling with some mental health issues that just wants prayed with this morning, may we, uh, may we do that this morning as well. If someone wants to, to be prayed for, that they would be welcome to come and we'd pray. Lord, maybe there's just some of us who need to repent of, of things in our lives that we've not given to you, that that our mind has been fixed in other places instead of on you. God, I love you so much. And I thank you for providing a way to peace that passes all of our understanding. Lord, help us to run that race with our eyes fixed on you. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't.
I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I built my life on Jesus. And he's never let me down. He's faithful in every season. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. He won't fail. is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand. Hang around me shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful for change. that this morning. Would you give him a praise? Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Uh, I want to introduce some special folks to you uh, this morning. This is Kyle and Katie Clerken and their beautiful little family. Uh, Kyle and Katie have come here this morning already, uh, baptized believers in Jesus, uh, wanting to become a part of our church family. And so uh, this, this kind of stuff gets me excited. And it's, it's pretty awesome to think back on uh, little did we know that hiring a maintenance man would lead to this section maybe almost entirely being 
Uh, but, you know, when I think of the ripple effect that uh, God has had in just hiring this Yehu back here, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's awesome. It is awesome. And these are good friends of Caleb and Zion's, and, and um, we just want to welcome them into the body of Christ here at East Columbus this morning. Guys, would you take my hand and repeat after me? I believe, I believe that, Jesus that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Would you welcome them in, guys? Amen. All right, guys, go ahead and have a seat. Yeah. A couple of announcements. I will have tickets for the Jason Crab concert out back today. Uh, again, that's uh, just a couple weeks now. So the 27th, um, right now here in the sanctuary, if it continues to grow, it might be in the gym. Um, but... Uh, 315 or so tickets have been sold already. So we've got a couple of weeks to go. So we're going to have a full house. Jason Crabb is excellent. If you like Southern Gospel, you're going to love him. If you like contemporary Christian music, you're going to love him because he is at the top of the charts in both of those. So I'll have tickets out back if you want to see me on that. Uh, don't forget the ladies' lunch on May the 11th, and they have a sign-up sheet out back as well. It's uh, $3 uh, for the fellowship and lunch and everything that goes with that. Uh, the Ruth Circle has a meeting tomorrow at 11 o'clock at the hangar uh, for lunch. Uh, so if you're involved in that, uh, mark your calendars for that as well. Um, uh, Donna Roof will be out back as well. I mentioned last week that we're trying to get some meals together for Barb Jasper uh, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. I believe are the days we want to deliver a meal uh, to her. Um, so she's going to have a sign up for that and also... Um, I think some instructions on you could, what she can eat and can have and that type of thing too. So see Donna Roof uh, for that. Uh, I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to go over some prayer concerns and uh, then uh, we'll pray so that we can move on with our day. One of the, I read something this week that I just want to share with you because it kind of goes along with Ron, what Ron is saying about we as Christians and kind of maybe how... Um, not only do we hide some of this stuff, but maybe we don't treat each other as we should when people are going through things as well. And, and, and what I read was, if you really want to experience joy in your life, start treating people in your community like the Messiah is among you. And you don't know which one he is. Man, how would that change how we treat each other and deal with each other if we just thought of the fact that the my, Messiah is in here among us? Uh, so keep that in mind. Some prayer concerns. Uh, Dave Fisher, Jerry Hooper, and Betty Anderson all had some surgeries this week. And uh, I know Jerry and Dave's with us, so that's great to see them. Uh, Betty's not here today, but continue to lift all those up in your prayers. Uh, Bud Swartwood is with us today. It's good to have him back with us as well. Uh, there is a long list of uh, prayer concerns on the back of the sermon uh, notes so make sure that if you didn't get one, you pick one up on the way out, and you can pray for these people uh, today and throughout the week as well. We also want to uh, be in prayer for the country of Israel, or the nation of Israel, and what they are experiencing right now. Uh, be in prayer for our upcoming elections, got some, even some local ones that uh, we be, need to be in prayer for. And uh, let's just pray for people that don't know Jesus. Uh, this world needs a lot of Jesus and people... Uh, who are lost and don't know him, we need to pray for opportunities to share the gospel uh, with them. Ron, you have one more? Okay, we've been praying for Cheryl Lackey's mother, and uh, Ron just informed me that she passed away last night. Uh, so remember that family in your prayers as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Uh, Lord, we thank you for these words uh, that Ron has brought to us, and um, we know without the shadow of a doubt that there are issues in this wicked world that people have to deal with. So, Lord, we just pray that we know that you are the answer, and we just need to come to you. We need to put our trust and faith in you. And uh, not that it just always takes everything away, but we know that when your will is done, the right things and the good things will happen because your word tells us that all things work out for the good for those of us who love you. So, Lord, we just put that faith and trust in you. Lord, I'd lift up all these prayer concerns, uh, so many things going on in people's lives, and um, we don't have the answers, and we can't take care of them on our own. So 
We lay these uh, people and these concerns at the foot of the cross. We give them to you and just ask you to deal with them as only you can do it. And now, Lord, as we get ready to leave this building, this place, and go out, just give us opportunities to spread the word. Give us opportunities to share our best friend with people that we come into contact with and always give you the glory, honor, and praise. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here.